it's been really dry. It's been one of the worst droughts that I've been through. So we had about 300 cows on this field for 21 days, and uh, this year we'll be lucky to get two days worth of grazing out of it. We didn't get any rain really in June and July, and that's when the drought really impacted us a lot heavier than it had been the year before. We needed to destock by about 30%. Once destocking begins, the markets are all going to be flooded with good cattle, and, and buyers are going to be at the advantage at that point. Our regenerative journey started with seven research ranches total of 14,000 acres. Located across southern Oklahoma, each ranch property is unique in topography, use, and history. We want to take you along on our journey, showing you the challenges, the lessons we've learned, and the victories along the way to regenerating the ranch. Times of droughts are tough. Tough on the land, our forage, and our livestock. Last year, these summer cover crops you're seeing, seeing here was six, eight foot tall this time of the year. This stuff was planted around the first of May. Got a little rain once we planted it and got a decent stand. Uh, afterwards, we've had very little rain since. We planted about 15 different seeds in this, this actual mix here. Uh, it was mainly half grasses and half broad leaves, somewhere around in there, some legumes. The, you know, this pearl millet, this time of the year, it should, be, it should be fully grown and it should be five foot tall and full of leaves. Uh, this year's a completely different year. This is probably one of a, one of our poorer areas this year. Last year we, we had about 300 cows on this field for 21 days. And uh, this year we'll be lucky to get two days worth of grazing out of it. And we'll, if we graze it, we'll, we'll probably come in here in the next few days and take a little bit of what's here and, and move on. The drought really started last year. Last summer we had some timely rain which kept our growing season pretty productive, but we still were about 70% of normal all during the growing season last year. And then last fall, we didn't get the timely rain and had a failure of our winter cover crop. And then this spring, we had a couple really good rains that filled ponds back up and everything was looking good. And then we planted our summer cover crop and it dried off and we didn't get any rain really in June and July. And that's when the drought really impacted us a lot heavier than it had been the year before. When you are in a drought, it is important to assess what you have in order to know where you can go. It's important for us to know what our carrying capacity is, especially where we're in this drought right now, so we can understand how much we need to destock and when to destock and kind of it helps our drought plan going forward is knowing how much grass we have. Of course, we don't want to take all the grass, so we'll probably err on the side of caution and destock and try to save our stewardship and save our grass, save our ground cover. And that's just what we're doing here today is look driving around making sure we got a good bead on what the ranch looks like and how many cows we should be running. So what I do, it's not super scientific, but we just go around five or six places in a paddock and measure the different grass, the leaf area, what the cows will be eating. So, you know, that's 15, 18 inches. So take that by the the density of it right now, everything's so dry. And just knowing the pasture we're in, this is probably some of the thicker stuff. I figure 100 pounds an inch seems to be a pretty good average for us. So as far as consumption for a cow, that's about 1,800 pounds. That's how we've been doing it. So we'll go around and just take several different measurements and write them down and then average it out for every paddock. And we go back and see how close our estimates were to how many days we stayed in each pasture. So that's kind of how we dial our eye in. And metric carrying capacity. Probably the most important first step is to know what you have because it'd be pretty hard to say how many cows or animals, livestock you should have if you don't know how much grass you really have. It's really a good tool for us to get out and see everything with the main focus of 
measuring the forage and understanding how much we have. So this is our property line. You can see we still have some green and growing grass. If you look on the other side of the fence, I think they probably mowed to help with the brush control and it just turned dry. So there's, there's not a whole lot of grazing out there. There's some forbs and things like that. And it's just kind of highlights the two different styles of management, at least in our area, is we, we like to leave grass and cover when we can. And here's just a different management style. You never, you never know their context either. So it's important to remember, we're not trying to talk bad about anybody, but the two different contexts here are pretty drastic. After a rough first day, the guys start early the next morning to pull the bulls from the herd at Oswalt Ranch. All right, here's what I want to do. Okay. We'll just, we'll start out down here and just kind of make a pass. There's three pastures here, right? Mm-hmm. And it's open into number seven. And so we like four bulls and let's we'll just kind of keep everything going that way. Okay. Unless there's like a pair over there or something, don't worry about it, but. Right. Let's get a lot of cows and bulls up into the pen. Okay. And we'll sort it out up there because these bulls are kind of try So, <laughs> okay. Let's just get everything up there. I didn't want to not get them again. We done we done trained them yesterday. So. <laughs> Sounds like you had a hell of a deal. Oh man. So. Thank you. Yep. All right. Sounds good. Today is day two of pulling the bulls and. Instead of trying to ride them out of the cows like we did yesterday and have a fight with the brush, we just pinned everything and sorted the bulls off. We weren't very far from a pin, so I think it's a little easier just to ride them out, but they knew they could get the better of us from yesterday, so we just pinned everything and sorted them off. I'm glad we did. We got everything. It was easy. It's still cool outside, so it went pretty good. We made the decision to pull the bulls to help alleviate some stocking pressure. So we just haven't been able to grow any grass, especially here at Oswald during our prime time growing season. Just mm -hmm. Has it rained, you know, what was the stretch? I think we had like 60 days with no measurable rain. Mm -hmm. So that's right in the middle of the time we need to be growing grass. So we're, we're preemptively destocking because we know we're going to have to. Pulling the bulls was kind of a, a twofold decision because we can sync up our calving season better for next year if it does start raining anyway. But also it gives us a chance to market some cows without having to lose any bread animals. I mean, the first thing is eliminate open cows and then trying to keep heifers back. If we get through this drought, it'll be hard to find a good female. Yeah. The experts probably argue over what the best first step is to wean early or to pull the bulls early. So after we really thought about it, we decided that pulling the bulls was going to be the best first step. You know, that was in July when we hadn't had hardly any rain. We figured if it did haul off and start raining in the fall, which it can do around here, if we pulled the bulls early, we would still be able to salvage a bigger calf crop, but also it would sink all of our cows to have a shorter calving window the next year. So we saw it as a win-win to challenge the cows a little bit by pulling the bulls after 45 days. And then consequently, we waited about 45 days after that and preg checked them. And so that's where we are now. Forty-five days after pulling the bulls, it's time to preg check. Uh -huh. hey, those two cats come in on down that fence. I thought they were too. The other two were running back the other way. I saw. I, I saw you head out. I thought once he saw them, I saw those cats. Yeah. Well, going down there. <laughs> we were just gonna wean the calves, we might sort the cows by age and coal on that criteria, but that might not necessarily give us the most productive cows for the ranch. We figured this way, by pulling the bulls, we'd get the cows that are the most fertile, can get bred in 45 days and also maintain condition. We chose to do that instead of just culling by our age structure, because we wouldn't necessarily get the most productive cows just by culling on age structure. Right there. Yep. Big kid. See the heart beating the ribs? She's fine. 
Good job, everybody. What was it? 67. It's going to work out pretty good just from the numbers we have now because we needed to destock by about 30%. So pulling the bulls after 45 days, we've bred about 70% of the cows. So that gives us 30% open cows to market as well as some of the calves off the native range cows. So we have something to market now. And the things that we're keeping on the ranch are the things that fit in that environment and are going to work there and have been working there. After a few small showers, we notice things are looking different at Red River Ranch. A couple days ago, we had a half inch, and that was probably the most significant rain we've had, but we've had a three or four tents a couple of times, I guess. Week before, we got a few tents and kind of greened it up, and then you can tell it in the last two days, it's really, or this week, it's, it's really jumped up. Well, I mean, this time is usually your 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 drier part of the year, but we're, we're actually pretty blessed to have have something like this this time of the year because it's been really dry. It's been one of the worst droughts that I've been through. Yeah. And uh, so we, I, I, you know, I I think from getting a little bit of growth and having some cover on the ground sure saved what moisture that we we did get. You know. Uh, just like on the the sand hill up here on the top of the hill, how. How, how many mare's tails left that we let it grow up and get cover and they, where they, they grazed it this last winter and I mean that there's hardly any I mare's tails was talking to Kevin place. there yesterday I said uh, did you take a picture last year because I mean that's it's a different it, deal it was I mean solid, that's yeah. uh, a worth a million words right there there's a ton of grass on that on that by just being rested and yep. that's the droughtiest spot and the there's still place. there's still a lot of green in it and it and it's not because of the rain, it was still it was still some green. This field's probably the most droughty field we have, and, th and this is one of the driest years we've had in 10 years, and it still looks pretty good. So I'm real excited about the way it looks because it should be burnt up by now. Through the years past, we'd come in here in the spring and graze it because it would grow some pretty good grass in the spring. Uh, come midsummer, when it got hot and dry, this grass could go from green and lush to burned up in two weeks. So we would try to, we'd always try to just graze it off and get what we could get out of it, say June and July, before it burned up and, and, and get, get the best we could get out of it and move on. We were probably managing it all the wrong way that way. Last year, I decided to, to just stay off of it and let it let it grow up some cover and let it rest. And uh, you know, here we are mid-August, and and this pasture should be brown. It should be burned up, but but you know, with the cover and the rest we've gave it, it uh, it's still got a pretty good green color to it. These hills behind us, you see, they've got the brown spots on them. Those are some areas that 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 there really isn't no grass growing on. Uh, those are some areas that I feel like through the years from overgrazing and, and lack of rest that, that I feel like we've created those spots. So just in the last two years, I, I feel like these spots are getting smaller and who knows, they may, be, they may not be here in two more years, so. Up north at our PDF ranch, we check in with two of Noble's ag consultants with some tips on drought planning and management for ranchers. We look at the historical data and, and typically there's a D2 level drought uh, in this part of the country uh, about every five years. And right now we've got parts of South Central Oklahoma that are in D4 and on the verge of D5. And so drought planning has to be a part of every rancher's thought process as they go through their planning. 
in a time of drought is a good time to be thinking about culling because now you know, hey, I'm in an extreme condition. I know these animals can survive. And so those are the ones that I want on my ranch because there's gonna be another drought in right. five years. Right, right. When they get animals in their environment, th those animals that we may wanna cull out or those that don't persist or don't uh, have a calf every year in my environment, in the particular ranch that I'm on, if, the, if they can't supply that for me, those are type of the animals that may do really well for somebody else, but they're just not for me. Another thing producers can do is when they go into planting, they don't stock at carrying capacity. You know, they stock at 80% of the carrying capacity. We gotta remember there's other wildlife out there eating forage as well, grasshoppers. You know, I gotta leave a little forage for my neighbor's horses if they get over the fence. Um, and, and so being able to stock it at, a, at a, a little more of a conservative rate, stock at 80% of carrying capacity. Here in South Central Oklahoma, we're always on the verge of a drought. And so you don't have to be as flexible if you build in strategies like that. As you've talked about when stocking uh, a pasture at, at carrying capacity or a declined rate, it's good to apply a conservative factor to that as well because it may not rain. Uh, you may have 1,500 pounds per acre of forage out there, but if you take all 1,500, uh, now you're not gonna have anything left for your above ground livestock as well as your below ground livestock. And it's just as important to keep those below ground livestock fed with the, the root exudates as it is above the livestock because they're just as valuable to your bottom line as the, as the, the livestock are. This forage, this bunch grass, acts as a shade for the soil, right? And so we talked about the soil temperature earlier and why in, in grazing strategies, if we, took, if we took this grass off to that, the soil temperatures would be hotter. Right. We'd be less resilient in a drought condition. Um, the soils would be drier because they would, they would, they would the, the water would be evaporating out of the soils fast faster because, the, because of the heat and because of the lack of the shade from this plant creating, creating that they almost, when you have good bunch grass communities, they almost create a microclimate. You can measure the temperature above the grass and the temperature just inside the, just inside the shade and, it's, and, and it may be 10 degrees difference. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things, if we want to be resilient in drought, we need to leave adequate forage on the landscape and not, not just say, oh, we got to give it, our animals need it, we got to give it all to the animal. No, you have to feed the animals in the soil, you have to feed the grasses as well if you want to sustain into the future. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point, Josh, in that it's, 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 a, it's a canopy effect, in that you've got to have this surface covered, but you also need to provide the shade. Uh, from from the plant growth as well um, because again at 115 degrees you're cooking soil biology and you're taking away that that opportunity for that organism to liberate nutrients and sugars for this plant to feed upon. A trigger point is just basically an indicator of now is time to act. You have done an analysis outside of that emotional time of the drought and said, this is the point at which my business suffers, this is the point at which my livestock are suffering, and this is definitely the point at which my forage base is going to be suffering. So that's a known point in time. And so it's easier to set that benchmark, that trigger point when you're outside of the drought, you're not dealing with the emotions of the drought. And then when it comes back around again, you know when to act. It's, it's a very cut and dry point for you because you know beyond that point, finances, livestock, forage base are all going to be on the decline and suffering. You've already got a plan established like where you're going, how you're going to look at the markets to, to determine where you take the animals, all of that sort of thing. You actually get, you, you actually get an advantage over the producers that are just being reactive right. because now you already know, hey, if I take to this market, I'm, I'm going to get, or if I, if I market my animals this way, um, I'm, I'm gonna be well above what my neighbor's just gonna have to haul them down to the sale barn. You don't wanna take it on the chin uh, when it's time to sell uh, livestock. Uh, and being proactive with that and, and seeking out alternative markets is a great way to be ahead of uh, the rest of the competition because once destocking begins, the markets are all gonna be flooded with good cattle and, and buyers are gonna be at the advantage at that point. 
the folks that work on the ranches have been excited about how fast the grass has come back just with the little bit of rain we've had. I think almost all the people could agree that on the ranches, they were surprised at how fast the grass came back to compared to what they thought it would be. So we'd, we'd get an inch and a half or two inches of rain and everything greened up and kind of started growing again. So I think that was a testament to our management from last summer and through the winter up till now. We're hopeful that just in the responses we've seen from the little bit of rain we have that our stewardships will respond a lot quicker than they would have under a different type of management.